Well, hello, everybody. Not yet, not like? yet, not yet. Oh, not sorry, yet. sorry. I'll let you know. Well, thank you, Veronica. Mm. And you're live. Well, hello, everybody. Welcome for this panel entitled, What is the Brazilian Fake News Bill? It's a great honor to moderate this conversation here at RightsCon, especially taking into consideration the, the importance of this debate for the use of the internet in Brazil. Now, introducing myself, my name is José Renato, and I am a director at the Laboratory of Public Policies and Internet, LAPIN, a Brazilian think tank based in Brasilia. We are part of, and I'm here representing the Coalizão Direitos na Rede, Rights and the Network Coalition, a Brazilian entity which aggregates more than 40 civil society organizations and research institutes working in three main themes, digital access, privacy, and freedom of expression, and which has been a key player in the discussions involving the fake news bill. So today we will debate both the positive and negative aspects of the draft bill of the Brazilian law of freedom, liability, and transparency on the internet, the so-called fake news bill. Introduced on April 1st, it is an attempt to halt disinformation and viralization of content deemed harmful online. On the discussion in, in the middle of a global pandemic, with the Brazilian Congress working with expedited procedures, civil society organizations and experts on the matter have faced an increasing challenge for their participation in the debate. The bill has already been approved in Senate in a tight voting and is now being debate, debated in the Brazilian House of Representatives. Criticism over the bill ha has been mostly related to threats posed to the exercise of the rights to privacy and freedom of expression, due especially to provisions on the bill regarding traceability of communications and messaging applications and mandatory identification requirements after the receiving of any complaint. On the other hand, measures for larger transparency obligations and activity of platforms have been regarded as a positive outcome of the bill. Prior to introducing our participants, I would like to give a short overview, short overview about the platform's liability regime in Brazil. This point is important uh, due to the increasing debates in our country that such a regime perhaps would not work and should be transformed by a fake news bill. This, that, that has been argued by some. I will try to do that in one or two tweets. Under the Brazilian internet civil framework, an internet service provider should only be held accountable for the content shared by a third party in case it does not follow a judicial decision determining that the content should be excluded from the platform. This provision was put in place in 2014 when notice and takedown was a common feature in Brazil. Afraid of being held liable for users' content, providers prefer to frequently take down websites and posts under any larger or small complaint. So that being said, to debate the issue, we will be joined by Bruno Santos from Coding Rights, Paulo Renato from Instituto Beta, Monica Rosino from Facebook Brazil, Veronica Arroyo from Access Now, and Congressman Felipe Rigoni from the Brazilian House of Representatives and one of the authors of the draft bill. During their speeches, each participant will have five minutes for a first exposition, which will be answering the following question. What are the positive and negative aspects of the Brazilian fake news bill? After this first speech, which we will be collecting questions from the audience and each participant will then have three minutes to answer, to answer them. I will inform you as soon as you have one minute left in each talk. That being said, in the name of the coalition, it is a great pleasure to welcome such fantastic guest speakers and most of all welcome all of you who are watching us here today. I will now open space for Bruno Santos to start our panel. You have the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, José, and thank you very much, um, Access Now, for this panel. Um, I'd just like to confirm that my audio is coming through and that everybody is listening to me. Is that okay? Good. So good afternoon or good evening, everyone, um, depending on their, where you're at. Um, my name is Bruno Santos. As as Jose has already introduced myself, um, and I am the policy and advocacy strategist at Coding Rights. We are a Brazilian organization that aims to bring an intersectional feminist approach to defend human rights in the development, regulation, and use of technologies. 
Together with our partners at Coalizão Direitos na Rede, we have engaged with the process surrounding draft bill 2630 since its very beginning, and I am honored to be um, here in this virtual edition of RightsCon, and also for us, um, the coalition, to have this space um, facilitated for the discussion. Um, starting with my point, I would like to, to kick off this, this part of my intervention by saying that this regulation comes in a time in which the majority of countries are considering stronger regulations for social media platforms and private messaging apps in order to hold these actors accountable for the alleged influence in democratic systems and processes, such as the case of the consolidated WhatsApp influence in the Brazilian 2018 election. This draft bill also represents a change of the internet regulation mindset in Brazil, and more importantly, to the regime built around the civil rights framework for the internet. The internet, with the internet being besieged by disinformation, harassment, and threats of violence, this resulted in users, politicians, influencers, and even parliamentarians demanding new legislation to protect themselves towards infringement of their fundamental rights by the platforms themselves. Therefore, it is therefore it's possible to say that draft bill to 630 is part of a do something, do something ethos. Backed up, backed up by this generalized um, dissatisfaction with big tech and how they have been handling the design of these platforms that ultimately also profit with hate. But starting with the good parts of the draft bill, I would like to point out that um, this, this last approved version, the approved version under discussion right now at the House of Representatives, got it right in some points um, when it addresses topics such as platform transparency, set obligations for um, trimestral transparency reports, disclosure of contractors of targeted poly political ad content, and even when attempting its first take on ensuring users due process and right to appeal, most of the cases of content moderation practices. Acknowledging that there is a power imbalance between social media platforms and its users is key when dealing with the spread and disinformation. The draft of those provisions regarding users' right to appeal are relevant due to the fact that they allow us to reinforce the need for proper reporting tools on the case of weaponization of social media against vulnerable groups. Besides that, addressing the lack of clarity and transparency in content moderation rules is also necessary. We need those rules to be comprehensive with regards to the many contextual nuances of language and expression, and even less responsible for interfering on public speech. On that note, um, empowering users and providing them with the right mechanisms and tools such as the right to appeal content moderation decisions, access to remedy, remedies regarding improper removals, and even more transparency about content moderation rules is definitely key. Starting with the bad side of the draft bill, um, there are some provisions who are worrying, um, and th those provisions are regarding app traceability. So what I'm saying is that they are regarding the retention of forwarded message metadata and users identification on the case of complaints um, in authentic or automated accounts. And these are still, as I said, um, a point of concern due to the fact that they do not comply with data protection principles such as necessity and purpose, leading to practice of mass surveillance. Um, by imposing compulsory data retention of who talks to who, which data is what will have to be retained until the message does not reach the proposed requirements for going viral, the, the approved version of the draft bill ended up being populated by a rather punitive approach to internet users, addressing everyone as potential malicious actors and subverting ideas such as the presumption of innocence. Another issue is that the draft bill um, gives police, plat police power to platforms to request user identification in particular cases, and this might open the margin to abuse and let platforms reaffirm practices of data capitalism in which the more info they have on us, more, more than they profit. So um, instead of seeking to increase user, user databases and implementing surveillance over private communication, um, we believe that Brazil should be concerned with enforcing its recently approved and not yet applicable data protection law and also implementing our DPA in order for us to achieve the highest protective mechanism to the right of private, right, for right to privacy. Um, last but not least, we need to reconcile the protection of personal data with the freedom of expression and access to information. The House of Represent Representatives here should reject this provisions, um, traceability and user identification, that might result in increasing private surveillance over users and on the massive and disproportional collection of personal data as a remedy to the malicious spread of this information. And then I would like um, to end on two bullet points, please. First of all, 
we need to enforce data protection framework to be able to protect users from the already practiced abuses and privacy breaches. And this is part of a consistent strategy of fighting disinformation. Also, um, this path should be right and human rights based. And this strategy has to consider the need to ensure users their right to appeal to content moderation decisions, access to remedies and platform transparency. Um, I'll stop here and, and just so I'll, I'll give the floor to my fellow candidates. And I thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Bruna, so much for your presentation. It was really enlightening. Uh, I would like then to open space for Paulo Renat from Instituto Beta uh, for his turn to speak. Paulo Renat, the floor is yours. Thank you, Jose. Uh, do you hear me? Okay. Uh, so, hi. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Being really amazed to continue this discussion opportunity. My name is Paulo Renat. I'm a founder of Instituto Beta, Internet and Democracy, a Brazilian NGO engaged in fundamental rights defense and promotion in the digital environment. As components of Coalizão Direitos na Rede, we are at the forefront of the legislative process regarding this draft bill. I would like to take a further approach on these two highlights. Uh, actually, uh, we are seeing Bruna actually at, at the main camera. Is that correct? Okay, thank you. So, uh, I'm not on your voice. So, uh, we, as long as uh, with coding rights, are at the forefront of this legislative process regarding this draft. I'd like to take a further approach on these last two highlights just pointed by Bruna. First, data protection and communication secrecy as main tools for fighting disinformation. And second place, as it concerns to online platforms, the value of transparency and substantive uh, due process in content moderation decisions. Starting from the late, the outline council shows itself as a good measure to keep the legislation as strong as it needs to be. At the same time, it not only limiting itself to one or another online service, it only would need to have some improvements in its composition and a little revision in the expected assignments. So also the law does the right thing when it sets online platform requirements for moderating content. It does not forbid nor obligate, rather authorize and regulate. The small list of exemptions are the negative vulnerable points of Article 12, but representatives, as we expect to hear from uh, Philippe Rigoni, seems to be already aware of what would be needed in order to assure free speech and avoiding any kind of chilling effect without embarrassing any moderation that might come to be peremptory. And for the second highlight, I repeat, data protection and communication secrecy. The text approved by Senate has measures about traceability, which manifest a lot of good intent in assuring minimum user rights. In addition to committing itself in general to Brazilian, data, Brazilian general data protection law and to Marco Civil the internet, I can point first paragraph of Article 8 and sixth paragraph of Article 13 as concrete provi provisions aimed not to weaken data protection, respectively, while regulating the suspicion of social media accounts and reports production by the, the text. On the other hand, Article 10 is altogether contestable when trying to restrain this information to become viral under the so-called mass forwarding record keeping. This prediction uh, subjects the population as a whole to a high risk in the face of possible abusive requirements for personal information, measures of misuse of their data by companies 
and uh, events or leaks. Everyone's data will be mandatorily saved by the applications for at least 15 days. Uh, and during that time, during that period, every message will be compared to all the other messages in order to see if they fit into the mass forwarding hypothesis. All people who, for any legitimate or involuntary reasons, participate in the, the after, uh, 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 after verified chain of uh, mass forwarding, uh, under the content sharing, such journalists, researchers, parliamentarians, and any citizen, whoever eventually forward a post, even in order to denounce it, will be who have uh, the records kept. All messages that circulate more in messaging apps will be considered a priori suspicious and tracked without any indication of illegacy. On the other hand, if a message is not forwarded by five, but for at, uh, at maximum four senders or one sender, it record, its records will not be kept even though it might reach 10,000 receivers. Another worry, in case of a judicial process involving any content, it will be duty of the people involved to explain their non relationship with any disinformation dissemination. It is a serious threat of uh, the principle of innocence presumption, and yes, it can impact the exercise of freedom of expression and communication in private messaging applications. That's it for now. Well, thank you so much, Paul Renat. Thank you for your your explanation. Uh, well, it has been a, a key issue of this of this draft bill is the suggestions related to especially traceability and identification that both Henai and, and Bruno talked about. Uh, but I think that now as soon as we as we hear from Monica, we will have another perspective on it. So Monica Wazina, uh, it's your turn now. Welcome. Thank you, José Renato. Um, and hi to everyone who's watching. My name is Monica Rosina. I'm a representative of uh, Facebook Brazil. Um, I'd like to thank Access Now and Coalizão for the amazing invitation. It's such a pleasure um, to be here today. Um, I think Hena is still on the main camera. Should we get that changed? I'm still <laughs> on camera. <laughs> because you're so handsome. <laughs> <laughs> and I just realized I have a bunch of stuff on my bed. Okay. Um, <laughs> so first of all, um, I think that the, um, the, the idea of this panel was for us to talk both about the positive um, and also the, the negative aspects of the bill. And I would love to start by, um, by you know, the, the great parts of it. Um, so um, I start by congratulating the Brazilian Congress, especially the lower house, for being so open to uh, debating the, the bill's text on such an inclusive manner. Myself and several other um, industry uh, colleagues, we have been able to participate on several public hearings throughout the past couple of weeks. Um, and uh, it's been amazing to, to see how open congressmen and congresswomen are to, to our arguments. And I think that's where the really democratic uh, conversations happen, right? When we disagree and when we're able to put all of our ideas on the table. Um, we, rec we do recognize um, at Facebook that the, the, the current text uh, shows significant improvements, especially when we compare it to the first versions that we, that we saw back then. Um, however, we feel that there is still room for a lot of improvement, and it, it is my, um, my hope that um, from an industry perspective, especially Facebook, that I can contribute a little bit um, to, to this conversation. Um, so we do know that the, you know, this bill arises from huge fear of uh, misinformation and disinformation and fake news and what it does to democracy. So we do understand 
that, um, you know, it comes from a good place, right? It, it tries to fight something that as a society, we recognize that that's not great. Um, at Facebook, we also recognize that misinformation is an issue and it's an issue that we take extremely seriously. Um, throughout the past couple of years and not just now, I think that's very important to highlight. We have been taking as a company several steps to fight um, misinformation in our platforms. Um, our main approach uh, is something I think everyone on this panel have heard me talk about it a million times, but I know there are lots of people watching that are not familiar with it. So I'm going to go ahead, excuse myself and uh, just say it again. But we use our uh, remove, reduce and inform approach. Um, we remove content that goes against our policies. And um, we've heard a lot of criticism over how we develop and how we enforce our policies. And I, I, we don't have a lot of time, but I just want to make sure to highlight that the reason why we have policies um, in place and we enforce those um, is mainly um, um, amongst you know, the top priorities is safety. Um, it's extremely important for us as a platform to keep people safe. Um, people will not be using our services if they're not, they don't feel that they're safe. So safety has a huge, plays a really, really huge role in how, how we develop and how we enforce our policies. Um, and just for instance, of, you know, things that we remove, certain types of, um, of uh, content such as child exploitation, for instance, that's that's the type of content that we do not allow. We have zero tolerance for. And we also remove millions of fake accounts every single day. Um, on the reduce part, um, we try to reduce the reach of low quality information such as fake news. Um, and the reason why we're not removing fake news, we're reducing reach is because we don't want to be put in a position to be the arbiters of the truth. If we were to say that we remove fake news, we would need to be in that position. And I don't think anyone wants any private company or government telling us what is true and what is false. So in order, but we do realize and we do recognize that that's a problem. So we work with third party fact checkers around the globe. We now have over 56 um, fact-checking agencies, all accredited by Pointer, which is an international organization working with us. Um, and, um, and they are the ones who send a signal that content is fake back to us. And that way we are able to reduce the reach of that content in our platforms. And with that, we also inform people, and that's the third pillar of our strategy, right? We let people know that this, is, this content was fake, um, it was marked as fake by this organization. This is the methodology behind it. Um, do you still want to post it? Um, we're currently now putting filters on, 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 on content that has been flagged as false. And we, we know that people um, um, on COVID related false news, for instance, 95% of the people who have seen it uh, with a filter, they didn't pass, they didn't click past to actually look at that content. So that's very, very significant, uh, significant for us. Um, and, um, and that, um, I really want to, that's just an introduction to say that uh, we're not against regulation. Our, our, our founder, Mark, has been really vocal about it. Um, 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 on, on, on several occasions, we've, we've talked about it, we've written about it. Um, but I would say, I would argue that we, we do not support any regulation that may hinder values such as innovation or free speech. Um, and that is why we do have some criticism to this particular bill, because we do believe that some of it might um, more directly or even indirectly affect such values. Um, and then I have a, a, a specific contribution on Article 17 of the proposed bill. And that's an article that requires uh, that any and all advertisers on Facebook provide a valid ID document in order to be able to advertise. Um, and we feel that that can be complicated uh, for several reasons. And I'd say the first one is privacy, right? Um, obliging people, every single advertiser to provide an ID, uh, that means having Facebook collect and retain 
a massive, you know, even larger amount of, of um, information data. Um, and, you know, if we go back to the language of Marco Civil da Internet, well, you know, we should remember that companies, you know, should not be collecting more data than needed to provide their services. Um, so we're, we're definitely against that. Um, it does defeat, um, it doesn't necessarily um, um, reach the purpose of the bill, which is to our understanding, finding people behind ads that are deemed as, you know, um, political or, or not great. Um, the information we already provide, such as IP logs and registration data, when combined with the information that um, internet providers also are able to provide to law enforcement in the course of an investigation, that information is already um, enough to be able to find people behind certain behavior or certain uh, content in our platform. And more important to that point, I'm almost closing. Um, okay. we, know, we, we know that COVID-19 has put the world under tremendous economic strain. Now more than ever, people need access to advertising tools that can help them go through these really, really difficult times. And to add extra layers of unnecessary paperwork, massive data collection and verification from companies will definitely slow the process down and generate large economic impact. We do believe that this provision has the potential to affect a million of small businesses and entrepreneurs, specifically small entrepreneurs, who use our platforms to advertise their services. Um, we're not against more transparency. We already uh, have a lot of transparency in place. We believe that certain ads should have more scrutiny from the public view. And I would just like to remind all of you that we do have different policies for political and issues ads. Um, whenever an ad is political, the public, anyone can see who posted it, who paid for it. Um, it gets, um, it stays in our ads library for such a long time. Um, it's useful for researchers, for academics, for authorities, special especially local authorities, uh, electoral. Um, it's an unprecedented level of transparency that Facebook has set uh, for the industry. And uh, we do believe that it's a matter of adjusting the text of Article 17 to make it specific to political ads. Um, that being said, I'm going to wrap it up just by saying that we do welcome transparency. We welcome more transparency. But transparency measures, they need to be proportionate um and uh the way article 17 is written up right now we don't feel that it's fulfilling its um its original intent thank you so much and i'm sorry i went a little bit over time thank you monica thank you so much it was great insight that you provided us with the view with the facebook view so i would like now to open space for veronica arroyo from access now our host here uh to share her thoughts on the theme so Veronica, please. Hi, thank you. Um, and thank you everyone who has uh, joined this uh, panel. I would like to use my, my time here to, to speak a little bit more how this can influence, how this bill, which has been on the debate for the past weeks and, uh, and months, and how this can influence the, the region. Because as you may know, this is, not, it's not the first time we're in face of a bill that has some problems, that has have some developments in all the debate, but can, that can also influence other legislations in the region and elsewhere. So here I'm talking to, uh, to, the, uh, to the people who are not in Brazil, who are outside to, to pay attention to what's happening in the country. So um, as the pre previous panelists have already mentioned, there are things that, um, that there are positive things and, and very uh, negative things. The positive things I'm just going to highlight again, the transparency part is quite important. But again, we are still have, even though the civil society, uh, civil society organizations in Brazil have been working very hard you know, to push, to put more um, and more safeguards to, to reduce all those uh, uh, risks for human rights, we still have the retention of data from one side 
and we also have the user and identification on the other side. So we have we, we still have two provisions who are there in the bill. And the problem is that the, the authors of this bill believe that with this provision and with others, they can combat this information. This information is a problem that we still have. Uh, that's part of, of our everyday life. But it's also very important to highlight that it, it gets really relevant on a special moments. And what, what I mean uh, with a special moments, for example, are like last year, we had a lot of protests happening in the region, like in many countries in Latin America. This year, we are all uh, facing this uh, COVID-19 crisis. And during this year and next year, we're gonna have elections happening in countries such as uh, Nicaragua, Peru, El Salvador, Ecuador, Mexico, maybe we'll have the referendum in Chile, also the one in Bolivia. Those are uh, key moments where information plays an important role and flow of information also plays an important role for everyone. And that's why we are very worried it, to have like a bill like this right now in, in that is well now is in the Chamber of Deputies and see how this is going to develop in all these days is it's important to us, but it's also important to all the people who are watching us at this moment. So that's why um, I uh, jointly with the Coalition Direito Nahedji, that is a coalition of more than 40 organizations uh, in Brazil, we uh, launched a campaign that's launched today and this is uh, we're launching a campaign in English and in Portuguese. So you are all welcome to participate in this campaign. This is uh, our main objective: is to request kindly to the deputies who are now the ones, who, the, the decision makers in at this moment, because the the bill is in the Chamber of Deputies, to kindly please remove their articles on on user identification and traceability from the bill. Um, I would like to briefly share my screen so you can see what you can all watch on your screen as well. Um, and I think I can. <laughs> uh, let me see. Uh, okay. So you can all see this. Uh, this is the. Um, uh, this is our campaign. Uh, we're still using the hashtag #SimFakeNews. Comdireitos. That's the hashtag in English, in Portuguese, sorry. But this is the text in English. You can go there and read them. It's a very easy way to understand what's going on in the bill, why we don't like the traceability, neither the user identification provision. And then we have tweets uh, already, uh, already written there, but you're able to uh, edit them and uh, draft them the way you want. So this uh, campaign is right now live in our uh, website and um, you can go there and check it. So I already post or stop share. Okay, cool. Um, so this is mainly why for me it's, and for everyone access now and in the quality zone direct in the hedge is quite important for us to first, please join us in this campaign. Uh, this is a very important moment. Rights Kong is in the highlights of many people around the world. So I think if we make our voice heard regarding this bill, asking and requesting the, um, the deputies kindly to remove those ones, to take a moment to, uh, to wrap up all the discussions that we're having and then remove them, that would be very nice. And I'm happy to continue the conversation uh, later. Thank you. Thank you so much, Veronica. Thank you. And also thank you for access now for all the, the, the assistance that have been uh, providing to the Rights in the Network Coalition. And well, last but, last but not least, I would like now to give the floor to Congressman Felipe Higoni from the House of Representatives and who has also been one of the authors of the draft bill that we are discussing here. So, Congressman, please have the floor. So, hi everyone. It's a huge pleasure to be talking to you right now about such an important thing that we are discussing in the House of Representatives here in Brazil. Well, my 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 contribution here 
it's gonna be short you know i'm i'm gonna tell maybe maybe three things about the history of this bill and positive points and negative points that i think there are right now in the bill first of all three months ago when me deputy tabata and senator alessandro we 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 actually put forward the bill we all of course we knew the bill wasn't um, as good as we wanted it to be so we started a huge conversation with the, the civil society a lot of special specialists i think it was more than 100 people and organizations that we we, we talked with so the 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 bill actually had a few versions so we, it, it evolved and it, it became a bit better and the senate actually was faster than the chamber of deputies to discuss it and to approve it so there are a lot of things that are important in the bill and a few things that are, i actually think that we need to change and we need to improve first of all the the positive things. I think there are maybe four or five major positive points in the bill right now. First of them, transparency on the content moderation. Because we already know that the platforms do a lot of things with the content that people post. And we need to know what they do, what they do, why they do, and in which scale they do it. And transparency in content moderation, for me, it is as important as transparency, for example, in public accounts to combat corruption. If we know better how our content, how the things that we post are actually moderated, we can all we can be more empowered to combat disinformation. The second point that I think is very important is transparency in the sponsored content because when we know that somebody is is actually sponsoring a content is much more um how can i say it's much easier for the person to understand why that content reached the person so that, that also has an impact on empowering the person the user of course and in combating this information in terms of um, private messaging, there is one point that I think it's very, very important, it's very positive. There is diminishing the mass messaging. You know, when, when we have messages sent to, to a huge number of, of people. This is very important because private messaging like WhatsApp, Telegram, and etc., is for people to talk with people in groups, in individuals, and etc not for somebody or, or an organization to sponsor and to send messages to millions and millions of people so we can actually um protect the characteristics of few people conversation right? if i'm understood and there is a, a last point that for me is one of the most important ones which is the identification of the robots you know, of the bots that we have in the internet because you know the false accounts and, and bots they are used to build false consensus on the internet and that has a huge effect on behavior of the people on behavior of the individual actually and also in the collective behavior and this is very important there, there is no problem in having a bot on the internet but there is a problem if that bot is not identified because the person can actually think that the account with which the person is talking with is actually a person but in, in many many instances instances is not a person this is very important for me and i think these are the the four major positive points of the bill and there are a few points that we are actually discussing and we are, we will improve in the chamber of deputies well first of all there are two um, provisions about private messaging that i think we're going to change it's, it's 
is not a consensus yet, but I think it's going to change, which is the provision about account suspension and the provision about traceability. Actually, the, the last speaker talked about that a little bit too. Another thing that I think we, we are going to, to change is about identification of the users, especially the point in which we ask the, the platforms to identify users following another user's report. The, this would actually create a report war in which a lot of people would report a lot of other people and we would have a mass identification. That's not what we want. All right. We want to identify bots and we want to identify false accounts. So maybe these are uh, the, the, the major points that we are, we, are, we are going to change. Of course, it's not all, but I think we have a very important opportunity here in Brazil to make a bill and approve a bill that is actually protective of freedom of speech and has a huge effect in combating fake news. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Congressman. Thank you for accepting our invitations for to stay here, and thank you for your for your words on it. Well, so we have some questions from the audience, and I'm going to since we do not have much time left, I'm going to uh, ask them for for specific participants and perhaps anyone who who intends to to share their their views and a thought are, are also welcome. So we have one question here from Eduarda Costa. Uh, she's asking, I would like to know if the main topic of this draft law is disinformation or if this bill will impact other issues. Uh, perhaps, Congressman, could you share some thoughts on this, on this aspect? Congressman? Well, I think perhaps he's off. Uh, well, anyone would like to 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 talk about it? Perhaps Paul Hena, Bruna, Monica. Would you like to, Bruna? So uh, actually, we, we have to, to have an, an historical approach, right? Uh, the the bill started in April. Uh, regarding fake news and disinformation. But at this moment, uh, we had this development that the draft bill uh, is not anymore aiming to define uh, disinformation or fake news, even though the draft bill has this sneak uh, of fake news draft bill. So it, it goes beyond the disinformation uh, definition and aiming, but it still has this uh, 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 main intention, right? To curb disinformation and help our democracy, not only our, our election process, but also the nowadays uh, 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 decision making for public sector and private sector and individuals. But it, it, it goes beyond as it aims to, to tackle uh, uh, transparency, to, to provide transparency uh, uh, under any, uh, any kind of content moderation. So we have a, a more broad uh, issue here, but it, it is, a, a, in resume, it is a historical answer, right? It was uh, about uh, uh, fake news in the beginning about this information, but now it goes beyond and it really has impact other issues. And that's what we are trying to, to say. It will impact uh, most of all uh, transparency and also the due process, not only for fake news, but for any kind of content moderation that the platforms you have. And it gives the public sector uh, the lines, the guidelines for what to do, and that's what we. That why that's why we are, are, are so in favor of the concept of responsibility, transparency in the internet. I guess that's it. Okay, thank you, Paulo. Thank you so much for your thoughts on it. 
Uh, well, we have one more question. This one is from uh, Jason Pillermeyer. I think that's the way uh, it is. I can say that. So uh, it is, if the law passed by the Senate were enacted without changes, which messaging services would be covered by the law and which, if any, would not? Uh, to some, to the some would not be covered. What if any principled reason distinguishes those? Those, well, I, I don't think I could understand it properly. Uh, but basically, well, I think that you could share your thoughts on the impacts on messaging services then, and which messaging services would would be affected by the legislation. How would be a, a proper, I don't know, maybe principled approach that we could uh, move towards it, that we could use to interpret uh, the legislation or even another, in case some uh, specific service do not fall under its scope. Um, I think perhaps Bruna could share some thoughts on it with us. Of course. Um... Yes, first of all, it is important to mention that um, this bill does not apply to any social networks or private messaging services that um, have less than 2 million registered users. So um, that will be literally the one um, safeguard slash um, bar in dividing or even um, distinguishing um, each, each and what um, services are under the scope of this law or which ones are outside the scope of this law. Also, um, it is important to mention that um, there is a lot of there. I, I at least I have two concerns with the definitions um, set by this bill, in which um, they have the definition as a private messaging service as um, an internet application that enables the sending of messages to specific and determinate receivers, including those protected by end to end um, encryption. So, pretty much that means. Uh, almost all of the services we have available nowadays. Um, and that is why, and, and I mean, there is one exclusion on the bill um, towards um, corporate use and also electronic mail services, because I mean, definitely will be a little bit of, of a bigger nightmare um, regulating personal emails in this. But also, I would like to come back to my previous point about the fight against misinformation walking together with data protection, because we know that um, as much as we understand that um, WhatsApp can, can and was weaponized and used um, in the means of manipulating the scores and manipulating the public space, um, this type of false information, um, this information, this information is also fabricated in order to cater to different profiles and personalities that are also built relying on all the data we already provide to those platforms. So, this is basically why um, Qualizão has been raising so many concerns about this. And we have been speaking so, so much about the risks to privacy and the risks to freedom of expression if we end up in a scenario where pretty much every single of these platforms will have to be monitored. Um, pretty much um, all of them will have to gather metadata. And, um, and in the end of the day, if they don't collect this sort of metadata uh, from the person who sends and also the person who receives it, um, we, will, we will also result in a scenario that um, maybe platforms such as Signal or Telegram won't, won't, won't be no longer allowed in Brazil. And then we will have to opt for the ones who kind of hindered privacy um, in order to be compliant to this bill. So uh, in a little, not so short tweet, that was my, my intervention. Thank you, Zach. Oh, thank you, Bruno. It was perfect. Uh, well, perhaps, Monica would like to share her thoughts on the theme as well. Sure. Um, well, I cannot speak for other companies, but um, the bill certainly impacts all of the private messaging apps within Facebook's um, uh, family of apps. Uh, so um, we would be directly impacted by it. Um, I would just like to briefly comment on on the 2 million uh, user uh, threshold. Um, and I believe the, the concern it raises, 2 million users might seem like a lot, uh, but it's not. Um, if a company is successful, it can very, very quickly, right in the beginning, uh, reach that threshold and still be really small and not have 
you know, the deep pockets to invest in all of the requirements that the this bill puts forward. So I do worry about, um, and that might seem a little bit odd, but I do worry about um, the bill killing space for new companies to uh, to arise in the future, right? Um, um, I sure hope there is a new Facebook in the future and uh, um, for especially for, you know, the small ones uh, that might not be possible because, you know, we know the challenges that startup companies, um, startup companies face. Um, also on, on, on the scope of the law, which was something that you commented before, we do understand that this bill came out of, uh, you know, fear for what fake news could cause. And I think, um, and we do recognize it, we do understand it. And I think it, it, it comes from a really, really good place. Transparency is, is, is amazing. Um, uh, more transparency is, is good for everyone. But again, it, I think we need to think of proportionate measures that allow innovation to still flourish, that allow new companies to still come onto the market and, and compete with each other. That, that's what drives innovation, right? Um, um, and uh, yeah, I think I have so much to say, but uh, Renato is looking at me with, <laughs> with those evil eyes. So I'm gonna wrap it. <laughs> no, it's okay, it's okay. Uh, actually, Monica, uh, since the, the question, the not the question, but the speech made by Veronica, uh, one, one question came to my mind, uh, which would be mostly related to uh, what is your idea uh, about uh, how should, should uh, this information be dealt, perhaps in legislation or in another means, uh, during the electoral context? Uh, do you think that there will be a, ch a, a way for us to avoid the measures established in the bill that do not allow for repression of specific political opinions. Uh, how do you think uh, we should deal with this electoral context? Because uh, at least in Brazil, uh, perhaps in, in December, we're going to have uh, municipal elections. Do you, do you have any thoughts to share on it? Yeah, well, thank you for that, that amazing question. Um, really, really important. Um, so for those of you who are, who are listening and don't know, we will have elections in Brazil. They're gonna be huge, even though they're not presidential elections, they're municipal, we're a huge country. So um, we're likely to have over 500,000, that's half a million candidates running for presidency. So, and, and spread it across, across the country. So that's, that's huge. Um, so just making a link to my private um, um, comment when I was talking before, um, uh, you know, regarding uh, political uh, speech, um, I think we're, we're really prepared. We've, we have the tools in place to give more transparency, to make sure that our users know when political a political ad is reaching them, and not only that, that they know who's paying for it. Um, and so we're we're extremely um, proud and and happy with the tools we have in place. Uh, but I think the one thing that, uh, as a society, we should be concerned about is um, really uh, free speech, especially as it stems from. Um, intermediary liability rule that's set forth in Marco Civil da Internet. Um, the one thing we do not wish to, you know, to be in the position to do, and we have seen certain, you know, some people advance that proposal is we don't want to be put in a position to decide what is offensive and what isn't to a certain candidate, right? Of course, we have our, our, our policies, our global policies, but what goes beyond that, it's up to the local courts to decide if my post criticizing candidate X should, you know, be removed or should stay up because, you know, he felt insulted by it. If, if I cross some line that, that relates to the local Brazilian law, then we do believe that it should be uh, a local judge to look at that case and then decide it. And to that end, uh, during election times, and our election period is really, really small in Brazil compared to other countries, we have a huge team in place to be able to comply with uh, court orders really, really, really fast. So just so you have an idea, um, in the 2018 presidential elections, we were able to comply with 
several court orders in a matter of hours, sometimes even minutes. Um, and, and that's really, really important for free speech. And um, I, I'd hate for us to, um, in a rush to approve a law to, that, that, that we risk important, um, important principles that are set forth in Marco Civil de Internet, such as you know, the safe harbor provision set forth by Article 19. Um, at the end of the day, if, if companies are put in a position to have a strong and large legal you know, um, um, uh, liability, um, the tendency is to remove more and, and, and not to let people uh, talk more freely. So I think um, I, I'd love to see us have an important uh, political debate when elections come. And I, I feel it's important that we keep some safeguards when it comes to issues such as this one. Oh, thank you so much, Monica. Well, we have now three minutes left. I would like to know if Veronica could answer a question that I, that I have here in a tweet. <laughs> uh, but well, uh, Access now uh, recently shared a report in which it analyzes uh, content governance uh, and share some recommendations on the theme. Uh, one specific point that, that you address on, the, on, the, on this report is how content governance uh, uh, affects the rights of specific minority groups. Could you share that in like one tweet? Uh, how do you establish a bridge between that and the Brazilian bill? Yeah, sure. Um, moderating content yeah. is quite, I think I, <laughs> okay, no, but I think it's, um, it's quite, your question is, is quite important because that's something I, I didn't mention before, but uh, all this, one of the things that are important in the um, in the bill uh, regarding obviously uh, moderating uh, content and also understanding who is on the internet basically uh, tackle the anonymity issue. And this anonymity issue is quite important because we have the right to be anonymous, we have the right to um, uh, exercise our rights in an anonymous way. And for some specific groups, this is most important, more important, uh, basically because they've been um, uh, they've been challenged because uh, sometimes you know uh, regimes or governments are are not so open to hear everyone, and or maybe they feel marginalized or there uh, there is some discrimination, a structural discrimination as well. So, speech uh, is the way of how they can exercise, they can how they can show themselves. And that's why content moderation in this specific case is, is quite important uh, because it's, it's not just freedom of expression specifically in the bill, but we have also privacy issues um, that are um, very connected to that. So for us, uh, it's very important to understand uh, that this bill will, will, uh, will be for everyone. That means with uh, the, this will impact also communities in Brazil. And we know that there are communities that might not be heard all the time and we should think about them um, while thinking about uh, deleting or this anonymity uh, right that we have when we think that we need uh, trustability as well uh, we think we need to think about those people we need to um, put ourselves in their in their feet and understand i think that's that's quite quickly uh, we have we do have as um, as you mentioned, Jose, we have uh, a paper. You can that also check it on on our website. We have detailed uh, recommendations for um, regulation from the states, from auto regulation in the case of private company or car regulation as well. Well, thank you, Veronica. And well, I'd like to thank everyone for this panel. Uh, and uh, just a brief note: uh, Congressman Felipe Higoni had to leave. Uh, unfortunately, because he was actually in in a meeting, and he very kindly came to came here to talk to us. So uh, I really appreciate that, and he deeply apologized. So thank you so much for watching us here today. Thank you all of the participants. It was great to have this conversation with you all, and enjoy RedsCon and keep an eye on the uh, the fake news the fake news bill in Brazil. Thank you so much. Thank you. Ciao. Ciao.